Just a few short days ago, I posted a 23 minute long video covering 31, if I'm remembering correctly, 31 tips and tricks for the Galaxy Z Fold 6. And if you thought that was all, I was done, you were mistaken because I am back again with a handful more tips and tricks because five days have gone by, now six days have gone by since I've had the Fold 6, and I have thought of a whole bunch more things that you might need to know about the Galaxy Z Fold 6. So the first thing I wanna show you today in this video is something that made a pretty big difference to the overall feeling of this device. In my opinion, the animations are just a little bit slow, but you can address this. What you're gonna do is go into your settings, and we need to enable developer mode. So to do this, come down to About Phone. I believe we're looking for software information and then build number. Click that a whole bunch of times until it enables developer mode. You should then see developer options right there. At that point, you can scroll way down to right here. You're looking for window animation scale. You can see that mine are set to 0.5. What I'll do is I'll put them all back to one. That was one and a half on that. I'm clicking the wrong things. There we go. This is stock. And I'll have to show it to you this way because the capture method, it's always a little bit slow. But you can just see how that normally looks for you. Zooming in and zooming out. It's not bad, but for me, it just seems a little bit slow. But after changing it to 0.5, it should literally be twice as fast. To me, that looks much more responsive and just it just makes the device feel faster. Now, while we are in developer options, there is another really important thing to enable. If we scroll down, I think it's towards the bottom, we're looking at force activities to be resizable. What does this do? Well, Unfortunately, with this turned off, I will show you certain applications like YouTube Studio, you cannot open it in split screen. So one app and then another app next to this. It is just not compatible with it. If you turn this on in developer options, suddenly it will be. Not only it will be, but every application will be compatible with the split window. It's one of those things that Honestly, Samsung should probably just enable straight out of the box, but it is very, very quick and easy to fix. Now all your apps can be split. For this next one, we're going to go into the Galaxy Store, which I think is just called Store, and we're going to install something called GoodLock. Click on your search, search for GoodLock, and at that point, you should be able to install this application. Once it is installed, you can open it up and you'll see all these different modules. They can all be installed by clicking the little download button. The first one we're looking at is Home Up. You'll see it there. Just click on the little download button for Home Up and get that installed. From there, you can do a few pretty cool things. But the biggest one, the coolest one for me is the Task Changer. You can change the way that your recent apps look. So by default, if this is turned off, this is what it will look like when you're looking at your recent apps, just side by side. There's nothing wrong with this, but that's just kind of what it looks like. But we have a much larger screen. So if we turn this on, we can have this grid view, which shows more applications than the other way. You can also do a stack, a vertical list, or this slim list. Personally, I am a big fan of the grid. You also have a mini mode, which if you turn that on, we'll see what that looks like. Everything is pulled down easier to reach personally. Not a big fan of mini mode. We're gonna turn that off, but you can see lots of different customizations that you can do with this task changer. Something else you can do is you can alter your folders. Let's go home really quickly and we will just make a folder. Let's drag these two together. By default, you can see that the folder opens up like that and the icons are gonna be about halfway up your screen. That might actually be a little bit difficult to reach. You can turn on a pop-up folder and what that does is it brings it down just a little bit, makes it a little bit smaller. Again, you can just sort of customize to some degree the way that your phone is going to behave using this home up. I'm gonna turn that back off because I'm not a big fan of that. But under home screen, you can go in and change the home screen grid beyond what the normal settings will allow you to do. You can push things quite far. Your favorites being the icons down here on the bottom. You can change the maximum of that. Home up is just a really cool one. Lots of different things you can do there. While we're in here, click on the little tool and install Registar. What that's going to allow you to do is actually map your power button to launch the Google Assistant. You can see your side key, press and hold action on and set it to 
Google Voice Assistant. You can also set it to all sorts of other things. But personally, I like it to be set to Google Assistant. So when I hold the power button, I'm going to have that pop up. Of course, of course, Gemini is installed. So that's what that is going to do. But that is a cool one. No more Bixby. Google Assistant is your option there. What about Camera Assistant? Here's another cool one. These Samsung phones are often kind of hit for having a little bit of motion blur. Well, you can speed this up a little bit by changing this to Quick Tap Shutter. What does this do? Well, basically, by default on these Samsung phones, when you press the shutter button, the photo is not actually taken until you release the button. This flips that around. Now the photo's taken the moment you touch the shutter. An extra picture will also be taken when you swipe or hold the shutter. So it's just gonna take that photo just a little bit quicker. You can also do prioritize focus over speed. So it basically will wait for the camera to finish focusing before triggering the shutter, but that will slow things down. As you can see, there are tons of modules and it would take me literally all day to go through all of these and everything you can do, but those are the biggest ones that I use there in good luck. Let's talk for a little bit though about battery, battery life protecting your battery, many different battery things. We're gonna go into the battery settings and we're gonna go into battery protection. By default, it is set to basic. When your phone is at 100%, charging will stop until it drops to 95 and then it will start charging again. Something else you can do is called adaptive. It's gonna to try to track your sleep and basically what's gonna happen is if it understands that every night you plug your phone in at 10 p.m. and every morning you unplug it at 6 a.m., it's going to charge slowly so that it basically arrives at a full charge right before you wake up. This should be better long-term for your battery's life. You can also set it to only ever charge to 80%. This should also sort of make your battery's life last longer, help the battery degrade more slowly. For this next one, you're gonna come down here to device care, and we are looking for performance profile. Here's the reality. Most people do not need the full performance of the Snapdragon 8 Gen 3. And if that's true for you, you can put this thing on light, and it's gonna prioritize battery life and cooling efficiency over processing speed. Let me just tell you, I have ran it in light mode. I ran my Z Fold 4 in light mode, my S23 Ultra in light mode, and I would never notice that that was going on, but that is going to give you just a little bit more battery life than you would normally have. Another really cool thing that Samsung phones have that I think just work really well is the screenshot tool. When you take a screenshot by hitting the power button and volume down at the same time, you're gonna get this little pop-up down here where you can edit. It's gonna load up this thing and you have all sorts of different tools that you can use. You can immediately go ahead and crop the photo, but beyond that, you can write on it. You can have a little eraser, obviously, to erase what you just wrote. And if I'm not mistaken, it'll also do cool stuff where like if it sees an image, it'll sort of help snap onto that. Let's go back and discard this. We'll jump into YouTube because there's lots of images here. So let's screenshot that. Let's grab our edit tool. And yeah, you can see here that little line. So it, it's kind of guessing like, oh, maybe you might want to just capture this set of images. So that's definitely pretty cool. When you get it the way you want it, click on the little download button and that is done. But you can also, when you take a screenshot of a page, you have your scrolling buttons. If you click on that, it's going to scroll a little bit. And you can keep scrolling and keep scrolling and you're going to have basically just a longer screenshot. But this is an interesting one that is not enabled by default inside your camera. I don't really know why this is not enabled by default. Let's switch this around so you're just looking at black, the, my desk itself. If you go into your settings and scroll down, Tracking autofocus. Keep the rear camera focused on the selected subject even if they move. What does this mean? Well, let me pick this up and we'll try to focus on my mouse. So we're going to click on focus there. And if I move my mouse around, it's going to follow it. By default, for some reason, that is disabled. I would recommend turning that on. So you may have noticed that when you take a photo and then you look at it, it doesn't look right for a couple of seconds before it then finally loads in. What's happening is that image is being basically run through a pipeline and optimized. If you go into intelligent optimization, you can actually go in and speed up capture time by doing less op optimization with medium or take pictures as fast as possible by not optimizing pictures after they're taken. Just a way to speed things up. You also have scene optimizer, which is turned off by default. As you can see here, make darker scenes look brighter, food look, look tastier, landscapes more vivid. 
So I've talked about sketch to image a couple of times already. You can trigger it a couple of ways, right? You can go into your gallery and click on the little AI button down there. And then you have your sketch to image and you can draw something on top of that image and it will try to generate it for you. But you can also do things a little bit differently, right? You can use your S pin. And if you bring the S pin over and you have your little pop up, if you click on that, sketch to image is an option there too. What's going to happen is you can just sketch whatever you want to sketch and it will try to generate that in AI. But there's something a lot of people don't seem to know about. If you click on the little button right up here, my little dots moving around it, you can actually change the transparency. What is that good for? Well, you can make this fully visible and then you can take the time to actually try to like sketch out basically tracing. I'm looking at my phone upside down, but you can basically trace out the image that is on your screen and then have it generate via AI an image based on that. You're probably watching a video right now where I did this already where I could actually hold my phone properly and it works pretty well. Just a little tip to maybe get the most out of the sketch to image thing. Here's another cool one you may not realize you can do. If you get a notification, a text message, an email, whatever it might be, I'm not sure if any of these are actually going to work, but we're going to try. You can long press on that notification and then drag it. You can't. Drag it wherever you want it, and you can split screen it. So if you're doing something and you don't want to lose your place, but you do want to respond to a text message or an email, you can grab that notification and move it over to that split screen view and jump straight into that split screen view with, again, not losing your place in your other app. If you're very familiar with Android devices, you're probably familiar with the ability to cast your screen to a Google Cast device on some devices, you can come into your quick settings here and look for this screencast option. And it's going to give you all of the different things that you could potentially cast to. On a Samsung device, that is called Smart View. And what's strange about it is that by default, Google Cast is not actually enabled. As you can see here, it's going to look for devices and it's not going to find my Google Chromecast things. It's going to have the Roku, it's going to have a smart TV, no Google Chromecast. That is really frustrating and really stupid. Good news is you can fix it. Let's go into settings and then look for labs and you can turn on Chromecast support. If we go back, hey, guess what? There are all of my Chromecast devices. I have no idea why that's like that, but for some reason it is. Let's take a look at the home screen here for the Z Fold 6. By default, you will have two different layouts. A layout here for your primary screen and then another different layout for your cover display. This is pretty cool because maybe you want to have different things on these two different screens. Maybe you use them completely differently. But if you want to do it the Google way, you can do that as well. If you go into your settings by long pressing, go into settings there, you can scroll down and look for, it's actually up here, cover screen mirroring. And if you turn that on, what's going to happen is you're going to use the same layout on your cover and your main screen. So I'm going to go ahead and apply that. And now what you see is exactly that. So this was my cover display. You noticed I had two pages. Well, here are those two pages exactly replicated as if there's a line down the middle. You may think I'm crazy, but I actually go back and forth between which one I prefer. Maybe it's just I'm used to things on the Pixel Fold and the OnePlus Open because that's how they function. I don't exactly know, but it's really easy to switch back and forth. And the cool thing is when you do go back and turn that off, it will remember the layout that you had made. So it's not really something that's a big risk. And lastly, let's go ahead and close this thing because we're going to talk about the always on display. You can see here on mine that my wallpaper is actually shining through. So we're going to show off how to do that. I believe you scroll down here to lock screen and AOD and let's click on always on display. And there you can toggle on show lock screen wallpaper. Now, if you want to say battery, you're going to want to turn that off. Now, there's also an option here for erase background. As you can see, it's going to look for a subject, basically a person or an animal, and it's going to try to erase that background from it. That's actually a pretty cool idea to give that always on display a little bit of a different look. If we go back here, now we're looking at lock screen specifically. Let's go to widgets because you can turn different widgets on. How does that work? Well, let's lock the device. This is the AOD. We're going to double tap to wake it up. And now if I tap on the clock, 
you will see the widgets that I have selected. My screen on time, the weather, the whatever music is playing. So that is where you can actually get into that option there. Let's, I'm failing to unlock it. Like I said, you can turn those on, toggle those back and forth right there. So there you go, guys. If the first video was not enough information for you, here is another video with even more tips and tricks. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more content just like this. And until next time, stay nerdy, my friends.